Welcome to Ghostly. Welcome to Ghostly. Does Typhoid Mary haunt this earth? Ghostly is a podcast that comes out every other week. In each episode, we take a ghost story or paranormal event and look into its complete history. Rebecca then gives us evidence proving that the story is real, and my job is to debate those pieces of evidence and get you, the listener, prepared to vote on if it's real or not. If you haven't yet, please hit that subscribe button. And as always, we're your host. I'm Pat. And I'm Rebecca. And we have a... Crazy episode for you guys. <laughs> um, you know, this pretty much, I mean, like during during the pandemic, I thought about Typhoid Mary a lot. You know, understandable. Yeah, exactly. Because, I mean, a lot of people um, were, you know, spreading stuff and they didn't even know that they were doing it. Right, because you can have it and not necessarily have symptoms. Yeah. At least this that's is- what they tell us. This is kind of along those lines, so it made me start thinking about this. But this is typically the time when we would give a shout-out on Ghostly. And there's two ways to get a shout-out on Ghostly. The first way is to give us a review on Apple Podcast. You know, we always love those five-star reviews, right? But we will take any and all reviews that we receive. Of course. And we'll read them. Um, the second way is to become a member on Patreon. Just go to ghostlypodcast.com and click on Patreon in the menu bar. And we have a lot of different tiers to choose from. And uh, after October, we're going to be uh, adding some stuff and changing up some stuff in the Patreon world. Absolutely. For the uh, better. For the better. I think, you know, we love bringing you Ghostly uh, and the Patreon is what helps us be able to do it. Yes. And we did get a new Patreon. We did. His name is James Cabela. Yes. James Cabela, thank you so much thank for joining. You. We really appreciate you Um you know, contributing to this. And um, if you want to get your name read out, just go ahead and join us. Absolutely. So again, go to ghostlypodcast.com, click on Patreon. Uh, and again, we want to keep bringing you ghostly. We are coming up on a uh, spooky season. Yes. And we've got a lot for you. Um, and we really appreciate your support. Yes, and we are coming up on our five-year anniversary. Yes, we are. I wasn't sure if we were like calling that out yet or not. Yeah, we are. We are, and we're gonna (laughs) we're gonna do something special for you guys for that. I I mean, I can't believe how much is happening this October. (laughs) Yeah, it's. Uh, We're gonna be dead after that. Uh, We we might be, but to to you know, you'll experience a lot of it just as a regular ghostly listener. But to experience all of it, yes, definitely the time to uh, to jump on Patreon. All right. So do you have a listener mail for us today? I do. I do. We actually have to finish our listener mail from a couple of episodes ago from Carissa. Oh, yes. Yes. I remember that. Yeah. She had two different stories to tell us. And so the second one has to do with shadow people. Oh. So I thought this was uh, was always a fun thing to talk about shadow people. So (laughs) here we go. All right. The second story goes all the way back to the shadow people episode and might be kind of long and disjointed. I'm an accountant, not a writer. (laughs) Uh, I've seen shadow people my whole life, but never thought much of them until I started listening to Ghostly and Bob After Dark. Shout out to Bob. Yeah, right. And got to their shadow people episodes. Then I realized what I'd seen. So Mm. below is a quick list of the more memorable shadows I've seen throughout the years. Usually I would only see a shadow once or twice, like the bowler hat man in my friend's bedroom or the ones I'd seen in hotel rooms while traveling. These meant I disliked staying in new places since I would likely be woken up by a shadowy figure standing over me, scaring the piss out of me. (laughs) Wow. There were some figures growing up, usually in closets or shadowy corners, and these could have been my imagination, just like my parents always told me. We moved a lot when I was young, and each location had a different shaped figure. 
None of them moved from one house to the next. So I thought for the longest time they were ghosts tied to that location. And I truthfully still think they are ghosts of a sort. The place I lived as a teenager had two different shadows. One was a younger teenage boy that stayed in my closet. I'd seen him after I turned the lights. Sorry, turned off the lights and was crawling into bed. He always sat cross-legged and rocked forward and back. No matter how I rearranged and moved my clothes around, he was always there, so I ruled out shadows from my objects. The second was outside and scared the daylights out of me. I used to love sleeping with the curtains up on the window and would fall asleep looking at the stars. One night, I woke up to a very large figure staring in my window at me. I screamed bloody murder and woke up the house. (laughs) Yeah, I would do that too. When I told my stepdad what I'd seen, he immediately ran outside to see if anyone was lurking. He didn't find anything, but told me to close the curtain and that it could have been the neighbor behind the fence. We had a privacy fence, but the guy gave my stepdad bad vibes and he thought he may be creeping and looking at me. So I kept the curtains closed after that and still do to this day, no matter where I'm at. The thing is, I don't think it was the neighbor. The shadow was very bulky, and I could only describe it as Sasquatch-esque. Ooh, wow. Um, I did see it through the curtains a few times after that, and eventually got blackout curtains, so I couldn't see the shadows anymore. Oh, I want blackout curtains. (laughs) Flash forward 15-ish years. Multiple houses and states later, and I am in my current apartment, and with the most unique shadow I've ever seen. I've moved around a bit, but now I'm in South Texas in an apartment. Shortly after I moved in, I met the resident shadow lady. She's very unique. Not only is she the first one I've seen noticeably wearing a dress, but she has color. Unlike others, she has never scared me. The first time I saw her, she was at the foot of my bed, just standing there. The next night, she was on the side of my bed, and I got my first good look at her. She looks like a Mexican dancer, flowing dress and big waves in her hair. Her dress is like the traditional style, but it is black with red in the bodice. I saw her multiple times in the next few weeks, and finally one night I woke up and saw her in my closet. I don't know what possessed me since I'd listened to multiple stories that said never to talk to them, but I was barely awake hugging my dog and I'd never gotten a bad vibe from her, so I spoke to her. I told her, it's okay, I see you, and you're okay here. I watched her for a bit more and then fell back asleep. I've only seen her a few times since, but she doesn't hover around my bed anymore. If she's there, she's in the closet or the door to the hallway. As I said, she doesn't scare me, and I'm okay with her hanging um, around as long as I am not being woken up. I'd take her over the Sasquatch man (laughs) any day. So there you have it. My two paranormal experiences finally written out and sent in. Keep up the good work and I can't wait for the next episode. Wow. I never, I never thought of a shadow person as, as having color. So that's interesting. I don't, I I can't picture that for some reason. Yeah. I'm wondering, I'm curious, you know, some, uh, some people out there, what, you know, what people think as far as like, I mean, you know, whatever label we put, definitely paranormal sounding. Um, But I don't know, like you said, you kind of thought they were ghosts at first, but now you're thinking maybe they're they're shadows, uh, shadow people. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I mean, where where the line between the two crosses? Yeah, well, I I really appreciate you writing in, Carissa. And again, you gave me something to think about. Definitely. Uh, If you want to have your story read on Ghostly, you could email us at info at ghostlypodcast.com or use the contact us form on ghostlypodcast.com. Uh, or another way, our, it's our favorite way, mm-hmm. uh, is to actually send in a um, send in a physical story through the mail. I mean, you can type it up. You can type it up, yeah. And But um, send it to P.O. Box number 264, Geneva, Illinois, 60134. I always say this, you're not going to remember anything. You're probably <laughs> driving or something. So just scroll to the bottom of ghostlypodcast.com at any time and you can get that address. Absolutely. Yeah, we definitely need your stories. So please send them in. Yeah, you running out? Yeah, we're getting we're getting low here. So. Right, so we need them all. We need them. If you've ever thought, okay, I got to send my story in because I know the there are those of you out there. Yes. <laughs> all right. So we've got polls, of course. Oh, geez. Of Why course. do you have to ruin such a good thing going on? <laughs> oh, man. Um, well, in our last episode, we talked about doppelgangers. We did. Yeah. And that was very interesting. It was. And I will say, um, we actually had more comments than ever. I feel like with this one, a lot of people had comments and stories and 
all sorts of things to talk about with this. And when we were at Fan Expo, um, people came up to us and, we were, and was talking about it. Yeah, so, definitely. Yeah. Um, so in this case, we have yes, 45.5% and no, 55.5%. Wow. Well, th- this is a really hard one to prove any which way, even if you are a, you know, Mm-hmm. a true believer as they uh, as they're called it's hard to prove that doppelgangers are i think you gave some great examples though in that in that episode that i didn't think about yeah um, well, so yeah kudos to you for that well i think there's a discrepancy because you know for me when i'm talking about doppelgangers being paranormal i am not talking about just seeing someone that looks like you out in the world and actually meeting a real person but that that's is, what i was thinking i mean like that is a about. name that we have for yeah, them yeah. But I'm talking about like you're in a situation and you see a person and then that person walks in and they're like, that wasn't me that you saw. You know what I mean? Like something that was more spooky. Sure, sure. But again, everyone can interpret this in their own way. Yeah. Well, so. I mean, the overall rating, though, is 3.91. So out of 10, mm. uh, which isn't it isn't high. It isn't low. Necess- it's more on the lower end, I yeah. would say. But it's it's still, you know, not not nothing. Absolutely. Again, remember, you can vote, right? After this episode, definitely uh, go right to ghostlypodcast.com and click on the polls um, and let us know what you think. Absolutely. I'm excited to hear about it. Yeah. All right. So I do have a ghost story for us. All right. Here we go. It's time. My brothers and I decided to sneak over to Brother Island last night. It's supposedly totally abandoned and no one is allowed to go in, which is pretty rare for New York. And while we're visiting here, you know, we don't want to just go to the normal tourist spots. First, we had to find someone to take us. It wasn't too hard. Seems like there are some addicts, uh, other thrill seekers like us that go there pretty regularly. So we hired a boat and told him to come back in a few hours to get us. It was so crazy looking. We got there just before dark so we could experience it with light and without. I'm glad because it was really unbelievable to see the overgrowth in the abandoned buildings. Who would have thought this prime real estate would just be sitting here in shambles? Well, I think we might have learned part of the reason why. We decided to go to the area where Typhoid Mary's cottage used to be. It's torn down, but we wanted to see it. Almost as soon as we got to the spot, I started to feel sick. I brushed it off at first. I assumed maybe I got like, I don't know, seasick or something, but it really didn't start until we got to that spot and it kept getting worse. I was weak and I had a headache. Then my stomach started to hurt and I worried that I was going to throw up. I told my brothers I needed to get away from this area. I just knew it was something connected to this place and Mary. They laughed at first and told me to stop being stupid But then my older brother shined his flashlight on my face and he saw red spots on my neck. He said, okay, we're out of here. By the time we got back to the place where the boat was going to pick us up, I started to feel better. When we got on the boat, the driver took one look at me and said, you must have gotten too close to Mary's spirit. I can see she left her mark on you. Wow. Um, So how much of this is based on fact? I mean, it's based um, loosely on, you know, reports okay. that people say. You okay. Know? See, I did not look into any of the ghost stories related to it. I just thought there was ghost stories. So, yeah. I mean, we'll talk more about it when we get to the debate. So, so is it mostly Mary or her victims? So, I actually couldn't find a lot of information of the okay. names of her victims. And like I, like a, and victims meaning that is a poor word it's for, a har- it's it's yeah, a hard one it's a one. hard one and we're, we'll talk about it but yeah. anyways this particular piece that we're talking about the island itself is definitely about mary okay not about anybody else all right yeah all right so we're gonna go ahead and take a break and when we return we're going to get to the pet facts all right 
Oh, hey there, Count Panic. I got a question for you. What's that, Bob? What do you know about Mothman, the Loch Ness Monster, ghosts, demons, and things that go bump in the night? Not much, Bob. Well, lucky for you, we host a podcast called Bob After Dark, where we talk about legends, lore, and the supernatural. Wow, where can I find this podcast? Wherever you find your great podcasts at. Pets. Facts. From a skeptic point of view. Pets. Facts. He presents it all to you. Pets. Facts. Facts. The Pet Facts are sponsored by Tarot by Ta. Ta is a professional tarot card reader with over 20 years of experience. He reads at numerous public events, private parties, and personal appointments throughout the greater Chicagoland area. He also does his readings worldwide using online services like Zoom. And the best part, as always, is he's hashtag Team Skeptic. So uh, if you want to find out more about Ta, visit and like his Facebook page at facebook.com slash tarot by Ta. It's hard to believe he has 20 years of experience. Right. You know, he doesn't he doesn't look that old. So. No, I mean we're not talking about yeah, some you 80 know, year old or something. guy or yeah. something. Yeah. <laughs> all right, all right. We're just gonna get into the pat facts pat here then. Facts. Uh so Mary Malone was born in eighteen sixty nine in Cookstown, County Tyrone, Ireland. Ooh. Oh, okay. Yeah. She's, okay. I she didn't was realize. Irish. Yeah. She was uh, an immigrant. Yeah, absolutely. And her mother had typhoid when she gave birth to Mary. This might mean that Mary actually had typhoid fever when she was born, but there's no documentation to support that. She might not have actually had the fever part of it. Gotcha. Okay. So typhoid fever is caused by the salmonella bacteria. Oh, I did not know that. Uh, Currently, it's rare where water is treated to kill germs and where human waste disposal is managed. Uh, Most of the time, we don't even vaccinate against typhoid unless um, someone's joined the army or going to... Um, go to some mission work or something like that. So traveling somewhere where the water isn't treated and, and they don't and dispose waste of waste properly. Properly, got yeah, it. Yeah. Okay. In 1884, at the age of 15, Mary immigrated to the United States. When she first immigrated, she lived with her aunt and her uncle and worked as a maid. But she eventually became a cook, where she could make a lot more money. I was just gonna say, like that's a big step up. That's a skill. Yeah, you and know? she wasn't like a cook in like a restaurant either. She worked for families as a cook. Okay. Um, but wherever Mary went, typhoid seemed to follow. In August of 1906, Mary started working for Charles Elliot, who was wealthy. Now, mind you, before this, several people had contracted typhoid that Mary had contact with. Oh, okay. Some died, some didn't. Okay. But a lot of people contracted typhoid. Typhoid fever actually uh, is one of those kind of things that if if you survive, you survive with some other stuff going on um, mm. a- after that. It leaves a mark on you. It does, definitely. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm assuming since it sounds like, I mean, again, we don't know about all the medical stuff necessarily, mm-hmm. but if her mom was sick with it while being pregnant with her, if that was some some reason she was born with it, yeah. I'm assuming throughout her life, like you said, she definitely had infected. She was born with it people. with kind of a like immunity to it, kind of. So that means that she would be a carrier. And she's she's actually uh, the first known carrier of a of a disease of this magnitude. Gotcha. So she had it and could give it to other people, but herself didn't feel any symptoms. Absolutely. Got it. Um, So Charles Elliott, a wealthy man, um, and she moved with with his family to Oyster Bay on Long Island. Now, within a short period of time, six of the 11 family members got sick with typhoid. Mm. And the thing that is different about this was that typhoid was considered unusual in this area. Because they treated their water, ah, they, they disposed of their waste. That's why like all the, whatever she had done previously probably was, because it was like, well, you're living with poor people and we all get typhoid all the time. Yeah, but actually she, this was like wealthy people that could afford a cook. That they well, would that's what I'm about. saying. Yeah, that's yeah, how yeah. it's, no, it was yeah, noticed absolutely, finally. Absolutely. Because these were people that didn't This get was it. in an area where it was like unheard of to get, gotcha. to get typhoid. Okay. So the landlord that owned the property knew that it would be very hard for him to rent out this property again after word spread of people having mm. typhoid at the property. So he hired several independent experts to find the source of the infection. If it wasn't for this guy, I don't know if we would have... Right. We well, we out. know money is the reason. <laughs> no, yeah. I mean, no, I, I understand it's his business, right? Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's his livelihood. Right. Yeah. 
Uh, so they took water samples from pipes, faucets, toilets, and cesspools, uh, all of which were negative for typhoid. Mm. So George Soper uh, was one of the investigators that was hired. He had already been trying to determine the cause of typhoid in other families. Mm-hmm. He discovered that a female who was an Irish cook who fitted the physical description that he had given was involved in all of the outbreaks. I see. He was unable to locate her because she generally left after an outbreak began without giving a forwarding address. So the Oyster Bay outbreak helped him to identify that Mary was the source of the infections. Wow. Yeah, so Soper uh, learned of the case while it was still active and discovered Mary was the cook. Okay. So uh, Soper first met Mary in the kitchen of the uh, Bones Park Avenue penthouse uh, and accused her of spreading the disease. Though Soper himself uh, recollected his behavior as diplomatic as possible, (laughs) uh, he infuriated Mary and she threatened him with a carving fork. I mean, she's, you know, he's basically (laughs) saying like, so it turned, like, I believe that you're spreading this disease. And she's like, I'm fine. Yeah, absolutely. I have nothing. What are you talking about? So Mary refused to give him any samples. And Soper looked into her employment history over the past five years. That's when he found out eight families that hired Mary contracted typhoid fever. Soper notified the New York City Health Department, whose investigators realized that Mary was a typhoid carrier. Wow. I mean, just think about she pot in her mind, right? The story is like, no, when typhoid comes to a place, I leave. Yeah, exactly. I'm out yeah. of there <laughs> so that I don't get it. <laughs> yeah. So um, things are going to get kind of crazy now. Um, so Mary was arrested as a public health threat. Uh, she was forced into an ambulance by five policemen. It took five policemen to get oh her in, in there. And Dr. Josephine Baker, who at some time had to sit with Mary to restrain her, or sit on Mary to restrain her. Wow. Mary was transported to the Willard Parker Hospital, where she was restrained and forced to give samples. For four days, she was not allowed to get up and use the bathroom on her own. Oh, like samples. Yeah. Oh, samples. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> this is going to get a little graphic at some point, just so you guys All know. All right, if you don't like the thing about the yeah. you know medical stuff or the... Earmuffs for a little bit. Yeah, then, there yeah. you go, maybe. Um, the massive number of typhoid bacteria that were discovered in, in her stool uh, samples indicated that the infection was probably in her gallbladder. Interesting, okay. Yeah, so during questioning, Mary admitted that she almost never washed her hands. Ah, it sounds so gross. It does sound gross, but this was not unusual at the time. Uh, Mm. The germ theory of disease still was not fully accepted. Gotcha. So we're in transition time. Absolutely. On March 19th, 1907, Mary was sentenced to quarantine on North Brother Island. And while quarantined, she gave stool and urine samples three times per week. Uh, Authorities suggested removing her gallbladder, but she refused because she claimed she did not believe she carried the disease. Wow. So no matter how much time they, they were probably like, yeah, well, maybe she'll get over it. No, no. Every time they test her, she still has it. Well, yes. At this at at this particular moment. Okay. Yeah. Uh, at the time, gallbladder removal was dangerous. So uh, people died from the procedure. Yeah, Nowadays, it's a routine thing. You know, I had mine removed. I felt very little discomfort from it. Yeah. And- I had mine out. Um, this was this was back in the day in the 90s. But I think even then, though, um, the laparoscopic way of doing it with like the little cuts was pretty new. Yeah, it was like a really big surgery. Yeah, well, mine was done by a robot. Oh, there you go. But the robot go. did not have a face and <gasps> did not talk to me. I was very upset about that. But yeah. anyways, um, Mary, Mary was also unwilling to stop working as a cook, too. She wanted to keep working as a cook because that paid her... I mean, not like where she had a ton of money, but enough where she could survive. Well, I mean, again, compared to being a maid or some other job, I yeah. mean, that's a, a skilled position. And if yeah. you're working for like rich families, like I, so I, they still do this, by the way. Like mm-hmm. I follow these people on TikTok that are like private chefs for yeah. f- these rich New York families. <laughs> and there's mm-hmm. always this like big thing. And where do they, they have typhoid? 
Uh, it do- doesn't seem so, okay. but we'll mm-hmm. find out, I guess. Yeah, so um, she had no home of her own, and she was always on the verge of poverty. So that's something we got to remember sure. during this. Um, this is when Mary got the nickname of Typhoid Mary after Sofer published his findings. Mm. Uh, now, not all the experts of the day agreed with the quarantining of Mary. Uh, some believe that she had to be taught how to be more careful. Like wash your hands. Yeah, wash your hands. Um, maybe don't be a cook. Right. Because you're, you know, touching food that's going to be given to people. Or and... cook, or if you don't serve any raw food, maybe, if, as long as you cook it first, maybe. Yeah, it's I... Like, I don't know, but. So Mary had a nervous breakdown after all this. Oh, wow. And she tried to sue the New York Health Department, but the case was dismissed by everybody up up until the New York Supreme Court. So mm. she had to stop. Uh, in a letter to her lawyer, she complained that she was treated like a guinea pig. She was um, obliged to give samples for analysis uh, three times a week, but for six months was not allowed to visit an eye doctor, even though her eyelid was paralyzed and she had to bandage it at night. So this is when she's being forced to live on the island. Yeah, this is she's still on the wow. island. At this I'm sorry. Point. Like, just think about it. Samples three times a week. Yeah, right. <laughs> But Mary didn't believe she was a carrier of typhoid. Uh, With the help of a friend, she sent several samples to an independent New York laboratory. All came back negative for typhoid. Oh, that's weird. Yeah. So so after two years and 11 months of Mary's quarantine, Eugene H. Porter, the New York uh, State Commissioner of Health, decided that disease carriers should no longer be quarantined and that Mary could be freed if she agreed to stop working as a cook and take reasonable efforts to avoid transmitting typhoid to others. Okay. So Mary agreed. She was released from quarantine and returned to the mainland. Upon her release, Mary was given a job as a laundry worker, which paid less than cooking. It paid $20 per month instead of her $50 per month. That's huge. Yeah. it's Less than half. Less than half, yeah. Uh, After a time, she wounded her arm, and the wound became infected, meaning that she could not work at all for six months. And that means that she would not get any income at all during that time. Yeah, there was no disability back then. <laughs> there yeah. was no no Social Security, no disability, none of that. No. Uh, Mary then started cooking again using fake names. And oh, the outbreaks no. continued to follow her. Oh, no. In 1915, Mary started working at Sloan Hospital for Women in New York City. Soon, 25 people were infected and two died. The chief obstetrician... Dr. Edward B. Cragen called Soper and asked him to help in the investigation. And Soper identified Mary from the servant's verbal descriptions and also her handwriting. Oh, wow. Mary fled again, but the police were able to find and arrest her when she took uh, food to a friend on, on, on Long Island. <laughs> They're like, don't eat that food. Yeah, right? <laughs> Mary was returned to quarantine on North Brother Island on March 27, 1915. And little is known about her life during the second quarantine. Uh, she, she did remain on North Brother uh, Island for more than 23 years, and the authorities gave her a private one-story cottage. In 1918, uh, this is something I did not know at mm. all. I knew about the two different times, mm-hmm. but I did not know about this. She was allowed to take day trips into the mainland. Oh, Wow. Yeah, Um, because it wasn't like a respiratory thing where she could breathe on people and they would get it. It's it's more. It's a not cleaning yourself and serving food. Gotcha. Uh, So they eventually built a laboratory on the island and Mary was allowed to work as a technician. So she washed bottles, did recordings and prepared glasses for a pathologist. Hmm. Um, Mary spent the rest of her life in quarantine at Riverside Hospital on North Brother Island. Mary was quite active until suffering a stroke in 1932. Afterwards, she was uh, confined to the hospital. She never completely recovered, and uh, half of her body remained remained paralyzed. And on November 11, 1938, she died of pneumonia at the age of 69. Now, there there are some people that say that they did an aut- autopsy on her, and they mm. did find it in the gallbladder. Um, but Soper never never confirmed that. And in fact, gotcha. he said that there was no autopsy done. Okay. Um, Mary's body was cremated, and her ashes were buried at St. Raymond's Cemetery in the Bronx. Mm-hmm. And nine people attended the funeral. Oh wow! Yeah. 
Wow. And they all got typhoid. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, what a crazy story. I mean, obviously there's a, you know, there's a lot there, but it's it's so much to think about as far as, you know, morally ethically yeah. you know i mean at one time i you know really and and i go back and forth on this mm-hmm. i blame her a lot for this because i think that she knew mm-hmm. i mean at one point she had to have known you know a certain point come on yeah even after the first quarantine you know it's like but then she went back to doing it like but and, yeah but then i do get that she was not making enough money to be able to survive off of right they didn't really make it easy for her to no survive in another way and this is before like welfare as you said and stuff like that this is stuff stuff that came about in her later life i believe Mm -hmm. so yeah i mean just to think about it though like for all these years you keep working places and just like you know on a free pretty frequent basis people get sick yeah but again you're not feeling sick so why would you you know your mind you're like oh wow man these these people just keep getting sick i don't know what's going on but (laughs) and also especially because of the pandemic we do understand the idea of a carrier right but back then she was the first known carrier Mm -hmm. of a disease of this magnitude you know so um this was not a thing that happened yeah, you know? absolutely. Especially, right, to be a carrier that doesn't have symptoms of their own. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I mean, to be fair, there were probably several other carriers of other things prior to this date, but they just weren't caught. Right. And I did I did read something and I didn't follow the thread with it, but that there was a guy who was also a carrier of typhoid that like actually killed even Typhoid more. Steve? <laughs> no, Barry? I don't know. <laughs> um, but that he had even killed more people than Mary. But yeah. Um, but I, you know, I didn't follow that through, but she, she was definitely known in her lifetime. And, and then when she passed, like now we use the term. Yeah. We call somebody a typhoid Mary. Yeah. If they're someone it's that, a derogatory like, term knows now. that they're yeah. sick and still goes and gets people sick. Yeah. That yeah. the term was used a lot during COVID. So, yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Um, so, you know, as I said, I go back and forth also, um, at some point you would think she should be tried for murder. Right. <laughs> I mean, I guess. Um, I mean, at least with maybe when she la- after she left and yeah. did it and went to work under a false name. Yeah, exactly. That seems like a maybe not a like a first degree a manslaughter. Yeah, or something? manslaughter maybe like where you're knowingly putting people in danger. Like yeah. you've been told what you're doing is yeah. wrong, and you know just because you don't believe what everyone tells you doesn't mean that it's okay. Yeah, exactly. Like you have yep. to follow what the law has told you you have to do. Yeah, you know. Yep. So that is I'm a. I mean, I guess she was theoretically, quote unquote, in jail in a way because she was forced to go live on that island. But, yeah. I mean, you don't want to say I want to put her in a prison. <laughs> she just no. get people sick there. No, everyone in the prison would be sick, especially if she was a she, cook in the like, prison. She'd be like, I'm really good at cooking. <laughs> yeah. You should let me cook at the prison. No, she needs to make the license plates there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we're going to take a short break. And when we return, we will get to the debate. Pat, what do creepy stories, funny ghost memes, and inside ghostly information have in common? Um, my life. (laughs) Well, yes, but (laughs) no, it's also Ghostly Society on Facebook. Oh, yeah, I mean, that too, of course. But aren't all ghostly listeners in Ghostly Society? Not yet. What? I mean, that means that they're missing out on all my jokes. Yeah, they are. And missing out on chatting and sharing with other listeners and us, of course. We love talking to our listeners. If you haven't yet, you should consider joining our private group on Facebook called Ghostly Society. Let's hope now they will. Unless they're a woman in white.
we are back. And Rebecca, it's time for a debate. It is. So, you know, there's not a lot, I'm going to be honest, um, that I could find um, with with the ghosts. Like I said, so do you concede then? No, no, no. I found some things. Um, You know, I feel like uh, I wanted to look into kind of like you said, like ghosts of like her. And again, do we call victims? Right. I don't know the people. And I and but a lot of them, she really just got sick. I mean, she people did die. Yeah, they did. You know, there was at least three people, you know, for sure. But you know, and you mentioned too, you know, in the in your history, but um, but I really couldn't find a lot of places that named them or that like talked about ghost stories with them. There's yeah. one that we'll talk about, but um, but really the place that it seems there's any kind of paranormal or the the place that has the most paranormal evidence is at the is in the island where okay. she was. I think that's because you said she was pretty transient, you know, so yeah. she was never really in a place for very long. So this is a place that she was at for more time. Yeah, she, so was, maybe. she was there for at least 25 years, yeah. let's say. And so this is that this Brother Island, New York. Mm-hmm. Um, and actually what's kind of interesting is that it's a place that has, I mean, we could actually do an episode <laughs> almost on Brother Island itself um, because in 1885, it was a quarantine oh, wow. um, place um, at Riverside Hospital there. It sounds like that Pavigula. Yeah. It, to be honest, researching this island, yeah. it like definitely felt like Pavigula. It was island. like we planned this in a theme or it, something, yeah, but we did not. I, we did yeah. not, you mm-hmm. know, but it was like where people went for treatment and to be like separated, wow, you know. Okay. Um, also, it was the site of New York's worst maritime disaster. Oh, wow. In 1904, the General Slocum steamship caught fire in the East River just south of the island shore. Over 1,000 people, mostly women and children, lost their lives in the catastrophe, with wow. many of the bodies watching up on the island. Wow. So I will say, there's a lot of ghosts and spirits that are seen on the island, but there is a claim that one of them uh, is a woman that they believe to be Mary. Okay. So, mm-hmm. I mean, again, <laughs> you know, could it be any of these other people? I suppose. Um, but I think that location, like I said, her old cottage, this goes back to my ghost story earlier. The cottage is gone, but that location is definitely one where people are said mm-hmm. to feel her spirit more than maybe see her in this location. Okay. So um, this is something that I talked about in the story. So supposedly, if you are in the presence of Mary... They people claim that you basically get sick, <laughs> mm. um, that they have these kind of fever related symptoms. So maybe they're hallucinating or they have um, stomach pain, weakness, headaches, vomiting, mm-hmm. diarrhea, and then they those red spots. Um, but that as soon as they're away from her area, then those go away. Yeah. Well, this could be like some derivative of. Uh, poison oak or poison ivy that would do it just with a lo- like a shorter term that it does it and you know these are defense mechanisms that plants have um, and they use it so that's where I'm going right. to go and I'm going to say zero on this one wow. so that, that was pretty easy for me <laughs> I mean I suppose it could be also psychosomatic Right, it like could people be. think. Well, the red spots would be difficult, but it's possible. I yeah. mean, I don't know, but like, yeah, but that's what I'm thinking. I'm like, yeah, red spots and like throwing up and abdominal pain, but then like the second you kind of go away from the area, you feel fine. Like that, that seems a bit more suspicious. So, um, so I don't know. To me, I am gonna give it um, a six. Like a it's kind of okay. interesting. Again, I feel like. You know, she was there. A lot of things happened. At, you know, she was very sad at her cottage. So, you know, I could see that being maybe a place that she would, you know, kind of leave some of her, her bad energy there for people. Okay. All right. Another area of the island that she's seen at is at the hospital. Okay. So you yeah, talked yeah. about she worked there, all yeah. of that. So she's been seen a number of times by a wide variety of people. Mm-hmm including staff members at the hospital during the area era, excuse me, when it was a drug treatment program. Mm. So there was a, before it was totally abandoned for a while, it, it turned into a drug treatment place. Um, so one account details an orderly who followed the woman down a corridor only to see her walk into one of the rooms, thinking that one of the inmates had gotten out of her room. The orderly 
hurried down the hall to uh, the exam room only to find there was no one there. And again, the assumption is that it could be Typhoid Mary. Okay, well, so so first of all, um, this is, again, one of those one of those things that's coming from somebody else telling a story of somebody else. Mm-hmm. So things can get confused in that. But the, the, I mean, the one thing that really is like glaring to me in this is how do we know it's Mary? Just, we assume. Um, so if the question is, uh, is, is typhoid Mary haunting this? I would say zero. And I would say negative because there's no proof of anything <laughs> if I could. But with the other thing, I would say that this is a this is a story told by people, and so it can be embellished. So I'm going to say it probably was embellished then, and I'm going to give that a zero too. So you got <laughs> double, double zero. zeros. Double wow, zero. Yeah. wow. I'm going to give it a five because I do think in this place in that hospital with all the tragedy that's happened there. I think it's likely that there was some spirit that, you know, was around and disappeared and all of that. Again, though, like you said, do we know it was Mary? That I feel less yeah. certain about. So, um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm actually going to change my answer to a zero times five. No, that's not allowed. It is allowed because it's zero. Well, then I get to do that at some point in the no, future. No, you can't You're because just what, keep that in mind. whatever you do multiplied by five is going to be an actual number exactly. where mine is zero. Exactly. So mine is zero. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so we actually only have one more. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. Um, you know, this is going back to that Sloan Hospital for mm-hmm. Women where she kind of snuck in. Yeah. Right. Um, and this one is said to be not only um, haunted with Mary's ghost, but also with those that she she killed there. Okay. Those two, um, two fatalities. People, yeah. yeah. Um, again, I, the only thing is, though, I couldn't find any specific stories. You okay. know, it wasn't like the, you know, orderly and the woman or anything like that. It's just that it is said that it is haunted by her and her victims. Well, we have no idea of what kind but of that's hauntings. That's it. We, nope. We don't know. Could be your silly orbs or something. I could be. Could could be could be sightings you know i'm i'm not sure so this but is, this is just a random thing right so we're just gonna it's just whatever the, it's haunted <laughs> by her and her victims there uh, you go zero rebecca that's horrible <laughs> <laughs> yeah i you know i mean i have to say it was a little it was a little hard to find um specific examples with her cuz I, I think it's because her story of her life is so interesting and so horrible in its own way that, you know, people don't really need to talk as much about uh, the paranormal parts of it. Um, Yeah. I'm going to give this one a three, like, you know, again, like, yeah, there could be spirits there, but that's about the lowest. I I usually go with. I've never heard you give a three. Yeah. Just because I, I could find there was like one place that said this, that was it. Like I couldn't find anything else about it. Um, I did also see one place I didn't even include it here because I was like, how many of these can we do? But um, that where she's buried is also supposedly haunted. But again, I could find nothing. Even well, someone that went to well, visit she's her cremated, grave. So yeah. are you saying the cremated remains are buried? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cause... No, she has. You said she's buried in the cemetery. Okay. Um, And supposedly there's actually not anybody buried near her, which I find funny. Like, like Yeah. They don't want to give them typhoid. They want to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, it was very similar to this, where it was just like stated. Okay. But no one ever has. I could. I could not find any specific reports of yeah. anything. Um. So there you go. So what would be your overall rating then on typhoid Mary haunting? I'm gonna say five. A five. Yeah. I mean, do I think that it's possible? You know that there are some spirits from her victims or from her somewhere. I mean, maybe, but what, I. What does a five mean for you? A five means to me is that it's possible, okay. but I don't have any for sure proof. Uh, you know, kind of one way or the other. Okay, yet. all right. So I'm going to give it a zero because that's 
you think there's no average. chance nothing? No. Okay. No, I don't think that there's any. I mean, given the evidence, I'm only going off the evidence that you that you gave me. Mm-hmm. I know no more evidence <laughs> about the haunting. So as far as that goes, I'm going to give it a zero. Okay. Sounds- that's what I always base my stuff on is what you say at the time. I understand. Yeah. We so got that, it. That brings us to the closing <laughs> arguments. This is our last chance to convince you to vote our way. We are each given one minute of uninterrupted time. We will time each other on our cell phones to keep each other honest. Mm -hmm. But Rebecca, you have a couple of times now interrupted during mine. So I'm just going to say no interruptions this time. Okay. Okay. So I want, because, you know, I don't want people to think that you cheat or something. You ready? Yes. (laughs) All right. And go. All right. So I think it's possible, of course, that Typhoid Mary's ghost could still be haunting this earth um especially you know where she was being where she was forced to live for 23 years um and you know where she really didn't believe that she deserved to be there that she uh really felt um you know that she was being punished and it wasn't her fault um and that there was nothing wrong with her sure i think it's absolutely possible um that she uh her spirit is somewhere on that island um But it's hard to prove because of the other tragedies that have happened on that island. So therefore, you know, when you talk about people seeing stuff or experiencing things, it's hard to say for sure if it's her. So do I think it's possible? Definitely. Uh, Am I for sure it's her? I'm not. All right. Uh, You still had a couple seconds left. There you go. Good job. Thank you. All right. Are you ready? Yes, I am. And go. So I do not base my um, ratings on speculation. I base it on facts. And in this, there is only one piece of evidence that is remotely has to do with Mary, and that's that you get these hives when you're on the island and you start puking and stuff like that. That's the only bit of evidence. And that can be attributed to a lot of other things. We don't know what kind of plants are there. We don't know what kind of um, bugs are there. It could be some kind of temporary thing that people get. So to me, there's no evidence in this at all to support anything. So I'm going to have to say no, and uh, I hope you agree with me and say no. Okay, there you go. So yeah, go vote. Yeah. Uh, GhostlyPodcast.com slash polls. We always want to know uh, what you think. And, you know, the believers have not been doing so well no, lately. No, So uh, I think there's a few skeptics out there that are just like, they race to vote. So if you're... They, they do not. They it happens do. throughout the whole two weeks. <laughs> no, no. I think we've just had some different stories. So, yeah. um, but uh, I'm I'm curious to, to see what people uh, say about this one. Well, I want to thank everyone so much for listening. Please share us with your friends and family as word of mouth is our best advertisement. And remember to hit that subscribe button If you haven't done so yet, Mm -hmm. um, we would appreciate that. Uh, We do have a bunch of people that we consider our producers on Ghostly, and they are our VIP patrons. We have Emily. Alicia. Carrie. Becky. Kim. Ta. uh, Ernie. Marisol. Shayla. Cindy. Kevin. Nicole. Darnay. Jessica. Sarah. Linda. And Alice. Austin. Aaron. Hope. And Candy. All right. So on the next episode of Ghostly, oh my God, this one. This one's going to be a difficult <laughs> I know one. nothing about this. You picked this one. This one's going to be a difficult one. Uh, we will be talking about the ghost of the circus train. Okay. Yeah. This is um, a thing around the Chicagoland area, too. Okay. And it is... Um, I, Rebecca's probably not going to like it. She doesn't like any talk of animals getting hurt. Oh, I so. don't like this already. I yeah. I don't know about this one. I was not a part of this. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry. It's on the books, so we got to do it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> It'll be okay, though. It'll be okay. Uh, and it comes out on September 6th. All right. All right. Until next time, stay ghostly. Bye.